Now, here's part of the, the, the moment when I'm going to spend everybody's money, okay? If there's one thing to spend cash on, it's going to be boots. Because if your feet are not having a good day, you're not having a good day, period, right? So if you're here, you want to go backcountry skiing, which is awesome, right? Looks great. Sounds fun. But if you don't, you know, have your setup yet, you've never been, you don't have a friend who's into it. Now what? Now what do we do? So I'll, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background about myself and then we'll dive right in. So I'm an internationally licensed mountain guide and uh, I'm one of about 150 Americans to have that certification. I own a little guide company called Veta Mountain Guides. That's our logo up there in the, in the screen. And uh, in addition to mountain guiding, I've been a writer since graduating university. So I've done magazine articles and things like this. But most relevant for us is I've written a couple of books on mountain guiding and sort of advanced techniques for being in the backcountry, whether that's rock climbing or alpine climbing or uh, skiing, ski guiding, things like that. So um, there's the cover of the ski guide manual. You can see my buddy Ben Tibbetts shot the cover photo, a fantastic photo of uh, a woman named Minna Riamaki uh, skiing the east face of the Entrevs. This is above Chamonix. Now this is an advanced uh, book, right? So the, the cover photo looks a little more extreme than um, what some people may uh, find fun in skiing, but uh, this is what I've been doing. And you know, this is sort of, a, this is the book you'd read after a few seasons in the backcountry in your first avalanche course and something like that. But we'll talk about some basic uh, resources and things for, for people as well. And so I spend uh, a good year, November through middle of May ski guiding, sometimes into June and uh, traveling all over the place. This is up in Canada where we were teaching a level two avalanche course with a bunch of friends. This is a, a really fun crew that we had there. And uh, the rest of the year, I'm all over the place. This is La Grave, France. A beautiful shot there of the peak they call La Meige. La Grave is down in the valley below. And here's a shot from uh, Norway ski guiding on Svalbard, a collection of islands. Oh, about a thousand kilometers north of the north coast of Norway. This is a pretty special trip as well, um, skiing around glaciers and wonderful wildlife, things like that. So that's how I spend winters is looking for soft, fun snow to ski and uh, traveling around a little bit. So this is from a peak called Loft Peak, which is oh, up in almost the coast range, way up by Terrace and Smithers, British Columbia. But we had about 5,000 feet at <laughs> 5,000 feet or about a thousand three hundred meters of skiing like this all the way to the valley bottom. It was pretty neat. So, so that's the allure of backcountry skiing, um, and we'll uh, you know talk a little bit about how you get into that and some first steps. And one thing we want to emphasize is this is not an avalanche safety course. So there's a bunch of avalanche education you can do. There's a bunch of books, resources, things online, and we will talk about those later. But and there's a bunch of these uh, webinars happening um, all over the place this uh, fall. So we consciously made a decision to. Uh, leave out a bunch of the avalanche stuff. We'll touch on it. We'll talk about some important things to consider, but there's a bunch of resources out there for you to get going with your avalanche education. So that's not to downplay it by any means, but we felt like there was a little bit of a, maybe a dearth of information about really basic stuff like bindings, skis, boots, things like that. So we'll, uh, we'll get into that stuff here just in a second. So like I said, we'll talk about gear, but then we're going to talk about where to go ski and how to even figure out where to go ski in guidebooks and online and things like that. And then we'll talk a little bit about who you're skiing with, because that matters quite a bit, uh, both for fun and for safety. And then we'll steer you in the right direction for some avalanche uh, education, both online and books, videos, things like that. And they give you some ideas. And all over the country, I know the avalanche courses are really busy in North America. Um, and friends of mine are adding courses all the time. So hopefully you can find a course this, uh, this winter, but they're filling up. So we'll, uh, we'll try to get you into one here in the, in the coming weeks. All right, let's dive into gear. Just like going skiing at the ski hill, you're going to need skis, boots, poles, all that kind of stuff. But we add to that some climbing skins. I'll show you some images of those. I even have some in the room here if we want to get to, um, into those a little bit later. And then we'll talk about the avalanche safety gear. So that's a beacon. Sometimes you hear it called a transceiver. Those are totally interchangeable words. A beacon or a transceiver and then a shovel and a probe. And I'll show you images of those. We'll talk a little bit about different models and varieties and things like that. And we'll look at backpacks as well. There's uh, you know, a little bit of a specialized ski pack that we use that um, you can get away without one for your first few times or whatever, but eventually you're going to want one. So, all right. So skis, right? 
So every year the buyer's guides come out and everybody talks about what skis are going to get that year and all this kind of stuff. And there are a million kinds of skis. If you're already skiing or riding, you can see a snowboard or a split board on the left there. If you're already going to the area, you know, there's a, just too many choices almost They come in all shapes, sizes, everything. But the good news is, is there's a million uh, great skis and increasingly more split boards uh, on the market. So it's not going to be hard to find something you like. For anybody who's a split boarder, I'm a skier mainly. So I'm, I'm definitely a little biased in that direction. And you heard, you heard me uh, use the word split boards. So for all the skiers that don't know, that snowboard on the left side of the screen there, that thing actually splits in half. And when you're going uphill, it looks as if you're on skis. And then when that split boarder gets to the top, she or he connects that thing again and then rides it downhill like a regular snowboard. So um, I am not such an expert on split boarding, but if you have questions, I have buddies who are full-time split board guides and I'll certainly hook you up with them in both Canada and the United States. But you can see all these brands you might recognize from the ski hill, Rossignol, Atomic, Fisher, uh, Blizzard, they all make fantastic backcountry skis. And they're mostly the same as a traditional ski with a couple uh, little modifications, right? So this is my buddy Paul up here in Canada and he has uh, a ski, it's a La Sportiva ski. And you can see that shovel, the tip of the ski looks like it's really comes up off the snow, right? So he's got to press together there. This is called early rise or rocker in a ski. So you often at a ski hill don't see skis shaped uh, just this way, like Michaela Schiffer and Lindsey Vaughn, they're not skiing on a ski with any early rise, right? But in the backcountry where snow is awfully variable or we're skiing really deep, soft snow if we're lucky, um, a little bit of early rise on the tip and the tail helps that ski float and manage variable snow. So that's why Paul's ski is sort of the shovels coming back up towards him uh, right there. The skiing was going to be good that day, so he was psyched. And there's a bit of early rise in the tail of those skis as well. So most backcountry skis will have a bit of early rise, at least, if not a bunch, in the tip and the tail. And then the other uh, large difference is we try to make those skis much, much lighter than you would uh, have at the ski hill. So the skis that Michaela Schifrin has beaten everybody on have uh, a couple sheets of metal in there and a really stout wood core. Some of these skis in the backcountry that will have no metal. They might even have, um, you know, a, a different wooden core. There's a, a wood called Paulonia that ski makers use. That's very, very light, but still has some, um, you know, some resistance and uh, energy in it. And uh, so these skis, when you pick them up, you're going to be astounded at how light they are. Uh, you know, there's an argument to be made as soon as they get below a certain weight, they get a little twitchy and weird. So don't get sold on the absolute lightest ski in the ski shop. Um, often it's not you know, such a penalty if you're a really good skier or you're skiing in soft snow, a lightweight ski is not such a big deal, but you can't always uh, count on the snow being perfect, right? So, um, but these modern skis, basically you're looking for a little bit of early rise and you can, you know, get something that's under 2000 grams of ski. Um, they make skis all the way down to about 900 grams. I don't, I don't know that I would recommend those. They're not as durable. They're a little twitchy, like I said, but that's sort of an overview of those skis. So read some reviews, ask friends, and then you could definitely get by with a used ski the first couple seasons uh, you're in the backcountry. Um, but, you know, the reality is we're skiing in the backcountry. You're going to hit rocks and, you know, little roots on trees and things like this. And uh, the skis get dinged up. So don't feel like you got to drop a couple thousand bucks on a, on a handmade pair of skis or something your first year or two. Once you've been doing it a little bit, then you'll have a sense of what kind of ski you might like and things like that. So you could rent a few times. You could buy a used pair at first, something like that. But once you get your ski, you're going to have to put a binding on it, right? So this binding here is what we call a tech binding, right? So there's two main groups of bindings. We'll talk about tech bindings um, or pin bindings. You might hear old timers say something um, like that, but these are uh, great for going backcountry skiing because they are far, far, far lighter than a traditional Alpine binding. So the emphasis with a lot of this backcountry skiing is going to be on lightweight because for people who are doing human power touring, meaning going uphill, we got to lug these things uphill. So it's nice to have a lightweight binding. This binding is only 200 grams for both the heel and the toe, uh, believe it or not. Um, this is a black diamond one. And uh, there's a bunch of these on the market, you know, marker and um, plume and all these. I'll show you some images of other ones, but you can see uh, those little pins on the side there. I'll show you a close up in just a second. Those actually snap into little dimples on the boot. So that's why people call them a Dina fiddle. The first binding, uh, a tech binding like this was made by Dina fit. And uh, so the nickname became Dina Fiddles because your first day, it's harder than you think to get those little pins into the right spot in your boot, but don't despair. You will get it. And uh, you can practice in the living room a couple of times before you go skiing. 
but those things snap into a dimple. I'll show you here in just a second. But so that's a tech binding right there. I'll show you a heel in just a moment. But the main advantage here is that these bindings allow your foot to come up, the heel to come up while we're touring, meaning going uphill. They're really, really light, but then they ski downhill very, very well. So going downhill, I really don't notice a, a big difference between this type of a binding and a big frame binding, but they allow you to go uphill, they're lighter weight, and they'll free your heel. I'll show you an image of that here in just a second. So here's another shot of that tech binding from the side with my ski boot snapped into it, right? So there's pins in the heel as well. You can see those two little um, pins coming out of the heel piece. I'll show you um, those uh, in just a moment up close. And then there's these two pins uh, that go into the dimple of your boot. So they're a little bit more fragile than an alpine binding. You can't be throwing these things around or uh, you don't want to be, uh, but they're light and they're efficient and easy. You'll notice on this one too, there's no break. So on a traditional alpine binding, almost all of us at the ski hill, we have a break just in case your ski comes off. You can't let it go flying downhill. Some bindings, some backcountry bindings will not have a ski break on them or you can remove it. So I don't ski with brakes in the backcountry all that often. And I have a leash on my boot, which you can see in the front there. I'll show you a close up of that in a second. And that's just to prevent my ski from coming off if I crashed real bad, or uh, you know, if you lost it at the top of a hill or something like that, it doesn't slide away into the abyss. So um, just like ski manufacturers, there's a bunch of good brands making these backcountry bindings. So Dinafit, G3, Plume, Marker, they all make a really good tech binding like this, okay? And the main advantages are super, super lightweight. If it's not for you, we can talk about different types of bindings here in a sec, but yeah, they take a little getting used to, but they work really, really well, actually. So there's the toe of a backcountry ski boot or, or a boot with what we call tech fittings. And that's just a dimple right on the side of the toe. And it's actually inside the plastic. When the boot gets made, that insert is inside of there. So it's really fused into the shell of the boot. It's very, very durable. And this just allows that pin binding to grab the toe of your boot. And then when we're going uphill, there's a way to release your heel and you slide the ski up as if you're on like a cross country pair of skis, something like that. So that's why that little dimple is there. Here's the heel of that uh, tech binding. Those two pins slot into two little um, channels on the back of the boot. So you can see it's really, really minimalist. It's very, it's a really spelt design. So here's the toe of that boot again. You can see there's the ski leash. Looks like a, a old school phone cord. If you're over the age of, I guess, 34, you know what I'm talking about, an old school phone. Um, my kids have never seen an old school phone though, so they don't know what I'm talking about. But it's got a stretchy cord, it's attached to your binding, and then I clip it up to the boot up there and that little piece of string coming out of my boot. So that's just a means of making sure I don't lose that ski. If I do crash and the bindings release and my boot comes out of that. And uh, I've never had a problem with these bindings releasing. I weigh about 165 pounds and I, you know, I ski pretty hard on occasion. Um, but I really don't have troubles with these things releasing very often. But it is a specialty item. We'll talk about another style of binding here in the next slide uh, that might suit you more if you think you're going to spend most of your time in the ski area, but want the option of going out of bounds and uh, going touring and things like that. So anyway, so that's a tech toe. There's a, a ski leash. So just like lightweight skis, this is a lightweight binding. But the main difference is that heel has a means of releasing the heel while leaving your toe in it, and you can slide the um, ski uphill. So your stride kind of like a, a Nordic skier would. Okay, so those were tech bindings. Now we're on to what, I, what I'm what i just calling a hybrid binding. So you can see this looks a bit more like a regular Alpine binding, right? So it's gonna operate a little more as if it's a, an Alpine binding. They're generally a bit heavier. This one I think is about 600 grams. So it weighs three times what the other one did. They're a little more durable. Now the one of the big advantages is if you're gonna go to the ski hill, uh, and just rip up and down groomers or do whatever you do, this is a great option because this will last you a bit longer. You don't have to baby it so much. It's a little easier to get in and out of. This is a Frishy Tecton. Um, there's a bunch of other companies that make them, but you can see the heel on this binding looks pretty much like an Alpine uh, binding. You just step into it. The toe has these pins on it, but it's a little bit more robust and it's got a little more release mechanism built into it. So arguably it's a little safer for your knees, right? I just turned 50 this year, so I'm uh, starting to think about these kinds of things. Um, and I bought this setup. This is my, my ski setup right there for skiing inbounds or doing you know backcountry skiing off the tram or something. So I don't have to lug this thing uphill, but I have a little more safety built in for my knees. There is the uh, same binding. Now this binding is now in walk mode, right? So the toe is still attached and you can see if I were in that boot, I could stride forward and then slide the ski along with me. And so it just releases the heel. So all these bindings have slightly different um, mechanisms to go into this walk mode, but you can see this is the Fritchie uh, walk mode right there. So you can see the boot will pivot like that. 
and you can um, go uphill, right? And as you do that, that little toe lever pops up and it makes sure that um, the binding stays on your boot a little more securely. When you're skiing, that toe lever goes down and that enables all the release mechanism. So you're less likely to hurt a knee or something like that. And so this, this binding has a you know, particular uh, sequence to get it into uh, walk mode. And then at the top, we'd go back into ski mode and we'd pop that heel down. So you can see this has a brake. You can remove the brake on this model, but I just left it on. I'm going to be uh, area skiing with my kids and my wife and stuff and whatever. So I just left these on and weight's not much of an issue. So um, now one thing on these uh, touring bindings, when we're in walk mode, you can see under the heel of the boot, there's a silver plate that's elevating a rise or it's a riser for the heel. On a steep uphill, if you put that little metal plate down, it'll make the hill seem a little less steep and it relieves some of the strain on your calves. So if I go back to that last slide, you can see the metal little metal plate is not down on the heel. And now it's down under the heel of the boot. And there's actually another one above that can go down and uh, rise your heel even more like that. So it's just a, a feature of um, touring bindings that you have what we call a heel riser or a lifter. Some people have different words for them, but different bindings have different systems for that too. So, okay, so now you see this binding is in ski mode. So the toe is in those pins and the heel is stepped into that heel, um, heel piece. And you just stomp down just like you would a, a regular old, um, you know, uh, alpine binding like that. So it's a little safer for the knees. They're a little heavier, but it does offer you the ability to tour and go uphill. So I often uh, will have these, like we have a tram right here in Chamonix that goes way up in the mountains and then we can do a big long run back to the town. So I don't have to lug these uphill, but once I'm backcountry skiing, I want the ability to go back uphill. If somebody fell, was injured, they lost the ski, something like this, it's nice for me to be able to have a nice robust binding like this, but I could put this into walk mode, put skins on my skis and go back uphill to help somebody out. Or maybe we don't like what the snow looks like that day. It's dangerous or something. We'll go back uphill. So this for me is a great balance. If you're going to spend more time in the ski area or maybe even 50, 50, something like that. Um, and again, Fritchie makes a different model. That's similar to this one. That's a hybrid marker makes one Solomon makes one called a shift. Uh, there's a bunch of options. So, you know, shop around, see what you think is going to suit you the most. But that's a little overview of bindings right there. All right, so now we've been stomping these boots in and out of bindings. So let's talk about touring boots. These are the two boots that I just happen to own. Again, bunch of good brands. This Technica boot, they make really good Alpine boots. They also make this touring boot. DinaFit um, is mostly a touring specific brand. So you see that's a, a smaller, lighter boot on the left. And the boot on the left weighs about 1,000 grams, so 2.2 pounds. The one on the right is, uh, it's like, 400 grams heavier. So almost a pound heavier. It definitely skis a bit better, but you see it has more buckles. It's a little heavier, whatever. So I just take them on different days. If I'm going for a gigantic tour where I'm going to have to climb for five, six hours out of the day, uh, I'll probably take the boot on the left because it's way lighter and I'm a little bit lazy. Um, but the one on the right skis really, really well, still tours very, very well. And for the performance it gives you, it's a phenomenally uh, lightweight boot. So, but again, a little bit of research on how these boots fit and things like that is uh, probably worth your time. So these are the main uh, difference with these boots though, is that they go into this walk mode, right? So I'll show you a close up of this in a moment, but all that does is it allows your ankle to pivot back and forth. So you have more range for and aft as you're touring. So they're way more comfortable to walk in. You can actually climb in them when we're booting up, you know, a steep slope, but this gives you this walk uh, option. So you can go forward and back, forward and back. And that makes this sort of Nordic ski stride. We do much, much easier. Um, so just looking at those boots, you can see there's a, a ribbon on the cuff there, and that thing will allow your ankle to flex forward and back. Um, typically they're quite a bit lighter. And they're a little bit softer often. The one, the boot on the right is almost as stiff as a, you know, pretty uh, uh, beefy uh, Alpine boot, but they're often a bit softer as well than a, uh, an Alpine boot you might be used to. So now here's part of the, the, the moment when I'm going to spend everybody's money. Okay. If there's one thing to spend cash on, it's going to be boots because if your feet are not having a good day, you're not having a good day, period. Right. So going uphill, You've got to have enough comfort that your feet don't get blisters, anything like that. It's like wearing a hiking boot. If you're going uphill for two hours and your foot is rubbing every way, you're going to have a terrible day. And then on the down, you've got to be able to lock that boot down, tighten the buckles, and it's got to ski pretty well. So if you're going to spend money on anything, go to a good ski shop, a good backcountry ski shop who has an experienced boot fitter. Ask him or her, hey, this is the kind of skiing I'm going to do. She or he'll look at your feet. I have a really high arch, for example. Some people have big, wide, flat. Fred Flintstone feet, feet, whatever they are, but you can get into a boot that's going to fit you really, really well. And then they can heat mold it to your foot. So I know that sounds like a bit of a, 
a deal, but backcountry skiing, you really got to have uh, your feet um, set up for success. Otherwise you're going to have a terrible day. So, um, if there's one thing to splurge on, I would say splurge on boots, right? So there's my sales pitch. I'm not making any commissions on this, but, um, go for it. So now there's that walk me mechanism on the back of one of those boots, just like all the bindings, many of these things work slightly differently. So this is that Technica boot. You can see that little piece of string. When I want to go uphill in walk mode, I pull that thing up and it lets my cuff flex back and forth. At the top, when we're going to go down, I put that lever down. It clicks in, and now it's going to act like a um, it's going to act like a traditional alpine boot. So that's it. You know, the Dinafit has a slightly different walk mode. Scarpa has a slightly different walk mode, and those are all great boots. Scarpa, Dinafit, Technica, Solomon, they all make really, really good boots these days. Dalbello is a really good brand. You don't see it quite as much in the states, but I would say don't get suckered in by what is the sexiest thing in the shop. Buy what feels really good on your foot. So there you have it. Once you're into the sport a little bit more, if you're going to continue to do it, some of these boots have more or less serviceable buckles and walk mechanisms and things like that, because these boots are really, really light. So they do uh, break more frequently than a normal Alpine boot. So touring or going on a trip, I'll often take a couple buckles with me in my repair kit um, on the sailboat in Norway, or I'll take them to a hut in Canada. That way, if somebody breaks a boot, we have a chance to fix it in the field or maybe do it that, that night back at the hut. So now another way you can spend money um, is many of these boots come with a really lightweight uh, liner to save weight. If you tend to have cold feet or your feet are a funny shape, then buying an aftermarket liner will allow you to heat mold it and the boot fitter can do a lot more with your foot. So they can not only mold the shell a little bit, they can also heat mold the liner. So keep it in mind, it's a, um, it's a, it's definitely an indulgence, but I do it to all of my boots. You know, it adds, uh, let's say it adds almost 200 bucks. So I know that's a lot, but again, if you're going to ski, you know, 20 days a year, even it's probably going to be worth it. You're going to be psyched. You're going to send me an email in two years and say, I spent 140 bucks on a boot fitter and it was the best money I spent. So, all right. So let's dive into skins now. Now this is probably the for somebody who hasn't done any backcountry skiing and hasn't seen very much of it, this will be a, like a totally new piece of equipment for you. So these are called skins because originally they were made of seal skins. So when the first, uh, they, it wasn't even Finland or Russia back then, it was just people 3,000 years ago. Um, they literally had wooden skis and, and this is, you know, three to 4,000 years ago, I think is how long ago people were doing this. They had wooden planks on their feet and then they figured out that seal skin, all the hairs would lie down if you're sliding it one way, but then they would stand up if you were sliding backwards. So for literally millennia they were seal skins around world war ii i think it was now must have been 20th century they figured out that mohair would also work so there's mohair skins and that's actually the the skin of an animal i think it's an angora goat and um those those work too those glide really really well people still ski on mohair skins the skin the skin you're looking at here is actually mohair so that is a natural fiber then around world war ii a swiss company figured out how to make them out of nylon so now we have Nylon skins, mohair skins, blends of the two, all this kind of stuff. But basically they all work the same. They have little hairs on the bottom. If you slide it forward, all those hairs lay down. If you start to slide back, backwards, all those little hairs stand up and believe it or not, you grip, right? So this is a contour skin. That's just a brand name. There's a bunch of good ones out there. On the underside of the skin. So there's what we call the plush is that orange part. That's the part touching the snow. The underside has, most of the skins have an adhesive. And it's this gummy glue that you can see my, this, I probably have got, I don't know, 80 or hundred days on these skins. So you can see they've gotten a little dirty, this and that, but it's glue. So you do not want to drop these things in a pile of pine needles or dust or dirt because it will ruin the glue. And then you got a real problem on your hands. Um, but they stick to the bottom of your ski. So we put them on when we want to go uphill and they work really, really well. Then you get to the top, you peel them off the bottom of your ski. So some people will roll them up, put them in their backpack. If it's a really cold day, you might fold them over, put them inside your jacket because the glue likes to be warm. And then you ski down, get to the bottom, put them back on your skis, go back up again. So that would be on a day when we're like human power touring or, or skinning or whatever you want to say going uphill. But the skins just allow you to go uphill. Now, if we're going chairlift skiing, or off the tram or heli skiing, something like that, I might have these in my backpack and be skiing one of those heavier hybrid bindings. Because then ah, the weight penalty is not that big a deal. I'm only going downhill with the skis. But if I need to go back uphill to help a buddy out, he fell or you know anything like that, I have the, uh, the option to go do that. But that's basically skins, right? So you want to protect that glue. 
You want to dry them every night you use them. So take them out of your pack, open them up and put them over a, um, you know, a dowel or a, you know, a coat hanger or something like that in a, in a dry warm room and let them dry out overnight and then store them. So when I say store them well, well, I mean, they come with a little thing. It's this little, that's like a little plastic fit that goes between them. So for one or two days, you can put them glue side to glue side, leave them in your backpack um, after they're all dried out. But if you're going to store them for the summer or the winter, all of mine are back in my gear room right now with this little plastic sheet between them sitting up on a shelf. You just don't put them any place too hot, something like that. So these are at 150 bucks a pop. So they're pretty expensive. You want to get as much life out of them as you can, right? So that's the tip of the skin you see right there, that little wire bale that goes over the shovel your ski, spread it along the base. And then often they have a tail clip, which I'll show you next there. And that tail clip is on the bottom there, that orange stretchy plastic thing. And that just snaps on the tail. This is a different skin. It's got a slightly different skin tip on it, but this is made by Pomoka, another great uh, skin brand. And uh, so, you know, all the tips and tails come in different configurations, things like this. So it just depends what you're psyched on, right? There is a newer type of skin out called a glueless or a hybrid skin. And um, they're starting to get really, really good. They don't have an actual adhesive on the bottom. Um, so they, they tend to stay a bit cleaner. You can also wash them. You can see this skin. I've got little bits of pine needles and stuff on there. Um, these are some of my older, older skins. You can see they're a little beat up. But uh, the hybrid skins are nice because you can wash them off. You got to take care of them when you're out skiing, keep them dry and warm. But they work really, really well. And uh, we're on like generation three of those. So they, they get better every iteration. Glue or glueless, I would say for your first pair of skins, if you buy glue, traditional skins will be great. And, uh, you know, just get familiar with how the tip and the tail attachments work. And uh, there's a bunch of options. Nylon tends to grip a little better going uphill. Mohair tends to be a little faster glide. If you want to do both, you can get them made, you know, 70%, 30%, one or the other. So they make a, a blend of the two. So try to keep them clean, take care of them. And that'll get you through uh, a, a definitely a few seasons with uh, skins, right? All right. So now let's dive into avalanche gear. So you hear this all the time, Beak and Shovel Probe. Everybody's going skiing with Beak and Shovel Probe, which is a great idea, right? So the Beacon, like I said, some people will call it a transceiver. I would say as long as you get a modern new Beacon, this is another piece of gear you probably want to just buy new so you can be the original owner and uh, know it's taken care of. Uh, there's a bunch of great companies making them. Peeps is having a recall issue with one of their models right now. You see that upper Beacon is called a Peeps. That's a brand name. They're made in Austria. Uh, very high quality beacons. One of their beacons has a faulty switch right now. And so they're fighting with people about warranties and things like this, but um, I would avoid that one. It's called a DSP, I believe, but this little beacon is called a Peeps Micro. I love it. I ski with it all the time. It's great. But mo all the modern beacons are uh, really reliable, really accurate. They work really, really well. So I'll talk about them in just a sec. Shovels are pretty self-explanatory other than you will occasionally see them made of plastic or carbon fiber. You cannot buy those. They break as soon as you're digging in real avalanche debris. And if your shovel breaks and God forbid your buddy's buried, it's a death sentence, right? So what I would say is buy one that's either steel blade, maybe aluminum. And then that handle you see right below the shovel blade, that thing actually extends. It has a telescoping handle. Um, and that's probably worth it. In an avalanche rescue, most of the rescue is spent digging, believe it or not. So you want to get a shovel that, you know, that handle comes out and it's got a durable blade so you can really dig. And the probes down below, those are all folded up. So when we unfurl that, it works like a tent pole. Like you go backpacking, you know, and your tent goes snap, 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 snap um, into like a longer tent pole. These probes work the same way. You unfurl that thing, tighten it, and it becomes a long 240, 260, maybe 320 centimeter probe, right? So once we get close to our victim, we start probing in the snow. And these uh, beacons are designed, or uh, sorry, these probes are designed to, you know, hit the person, you'll feel it. And, um, once you probe a little bit for targets and buried backpacks and things on an avalanche course or something, you will really quickly get, you know, the hang of it and feel like, okay, that's a person that's not the ground or whatever like that. Um, they make them in carbon fiber these days. And I would say eh, for your first uh, probe, just an aluminum one, that top one, the red and gold one is aluminum. It'll last you a bit longer. They're a bit more durable. The carbon ones are nice, but they do break. I've seen a break quite a bit actually, and they're more expensive. So I would say just save the cash, get an aluminum one for your first time. So when we're buying uh, these transceivers and beacons, I hear this all the time. What's the best one? Well, I would say Backcountry Access, Peeps, Mammoth, Ortobox, they all make really, really good transceivers, beacons. And whatever you get, look at it, see if you like the shape of it, maybe try to use it in the store a little bit so you get a, a sense of what the display is like. But once you have it, you need to practice with that beacon and really figure out how it works. 
and uh, and what its functions are because you don't want to uh, buy a beacon that's so complicated you can't use the darn thing so but most of the big brands now are really really good so i would just say stick with what you know seems like an appropriate model for you um when you have it treat it like an iphone right we don't throw our iphone in the back of the car at the end of the day with our wet ski boots you know if we're out skiing with our iphone we don't set it down in the snow and let the water like accumulate on the screen things like that so don't don't bang it bump it let it get wet don't chuck it to your friend through the air or whatever, take care of them because it's a piece of safety equipment, read the owner's manual, right? So make sure you know what kind of batteries it takes. There are a couple models that'll take a lithium ion battery. I cannot remember. I don't think any of them are taking rechargeable batteries yet. I might be wrong about that, um, but all of them you know, have different configurations. One model that I really, really like, the backcountry access one, the trackers, those are great beacons. They don't take, uh, all they take is the regular alkaline like Duracell batteries. That's great. No problem. But you got to know which one, because if you put the wrong batteries in your beacon, it's going to malfunction, which is not what we want, right? So they come with a bunch of different uh, functions on them. Some of them are simpler. Some have more complicated features. So figure out, it, it, does the beacon mark? Does it have a trailhead function? And once you do an avalanche course, you'll know what all these terms mean. But Definitely don't go into the gear shop and let the kids sell you the $600 beacon with all the bells and whistles for your first one because you probably won't need all that extra stuff, right? So just take your time with it. And then once you have it, practice with it, right? There are beacon parks where you can go where they have buried transceivers in the snow and you search with yours and then probe and hit a target. And then you get an alarm that tells you you hit it. Then you don't dig it up. Don't do that. The ski patrollers don't like that. But in Colorado, there's, oh geez, six or eight of these beacon parks. I know there's a couple in Tahoe. I know there are some out in uh, the Northwest. Um, in Europe, there's definitely one here right above Chamonix up here in the Braval and uh, Verbier has one. So they're all over the place. Just ask the local ski patrol or Google around. You'll find it. But practicing with the beacons, you'll see it's pretty easy to get good. And then what you really want to do is, is uh, figure out how you're going to shovel a person who's buried a, a meter deep and there's ways to do this. So we're not going to cover it in this uh, talk tonight, but a good avalanche course or a rescue course will teach you how to do that. So, all right. So you got all of this gear. I've spent a bunch of your money. Now we got to put it in a backpack, right? So um, if you want to buy a dedicated ski backpack, no problem. Um, there's nothing miraculous about them. They're just, they have a couple of features that'll help you organize your stuff. This is a, a backpack made by Blue Ice and it has a little sleeve on that back outside. So it'd be on the farthest part from you that just folds down and you have your shovel, your probe and your shovel handle all in that little tools pocket, we call it, right? And uh, remember to practice with your shovel, right? So you'll see those, those beacons are really, really easy to use these days. They're very fast and accurate, but the shoveling is what's gonna take you a bunch of time. So practice with your shovel. So that's a huge overview of gear. If I was talking too fast or something didn't make sense, then email me. I'll try to get it sorted out with you. Um, but spend some money on boots. I would say probably spend money on a new Avalanche transceiver and practice with it. Those would be, those would be my two giant takeaways from that whole first, uh, first section. So now that we got all that stuff, you got to figure out where you're going to go, right? So one of the really cool developments over the last like uh, 10, 12 years is uh, ski areas are now allowing us uphill access or uphill travel. So, you know, in Colorado, Winter Park allows it, uh, Arapaho Basin has been allowing it. I don't know what Loveland's policy is going to be this year, but, you know, out in Tahoe, the Northwest, down, down in um, New Mexico, everywhere. The easiest way to get used to your gear is to go out to the ski hill and do a couple laps up and down. So you get the hang of the bindings, your walk mode and your boots, your skins, all that. And then you're in controlled terrain. You don't have to worry about avalanches, where you're going to ski. You can just skin up on whatever uphill track they tell you to use. And then you get to ski down on the piece, the, the ski run. And so it's a great way to get into it, right? So once you're ready to start, you know, venturing out a little bit more, you got to think about where you're going to go. So the main thing is you do not uh, want to end up in avalanche terrain, right? Because that's a whole nother um, set of considerations. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But Here's my buddy Paul skiing up in Canada. This is on a pretty low angle slope. This is not an avalanche slope. It's not prone to avalanching. It doesn't avalanche. And the skiing looks pretty fun, right? So for these first couple seasons, certainly your first few times out, just don't go skiing on avalanche slopes, right? Uh, now you're probably already thinking ahead, like, well, how do I know what's an avalanche slope? So we're going to talk a little bit about that, right? But there's Paul skiing, having a good time. We had a blast. This was last year in Canada. This was like such a, a fun crew and we had a great week. So where we go uh, ski and split board, it really determines two things, right? Are we going to get quality turns? Is there good snow where we're going? And there's, uh, you know, there's some ways of figuring this out. 
Um, Parisi was asking me earlier, hey, you know, Parisi is not much of a skier. So he was asking, how do you guys figure out where the good snow is? And definitely there are people on the internet. Um, Joel Gratz is one of them who's, you know, really forecasts who's going to get the best snow out of this next storm. And he does that for ski hills and, and wherever. The avalanche centers, I'll talk about those in a little bit will often tell you who got the most snow out of these last storms and things like this, but guidebooks, friends, things like that will tell you, hey, there's good ski in here, there's good ski in there, things like that. Now, the other thing that we need to consider, we don't just go looking for deep snow and turn off our brains, right? As soon as we're gonna go into avalanche terrain, we need to make sure we're ready to do that, right? So if it's your first season skiing in the backcountry, maybe you have not done any avalanche training, you've never skied with a guide, something like that. I would just say, don't risk having any exposure to avalanche terrain for your first uh, you know, season or two. There's plenty of places to go without um, you know, having to really up the hazard. You know, So this is another big pro tip. Are you ready for this? Take out your phone, take a photo of the slide. If you're not an avalanche terrain, you can't get killed by an avalanche. That's as wise as it's gonna get. There you go. So I'm trying to highlight this in the sense that if you just don't go an avalanche terrain, then you can put that out of your consciousness for the first season or two. So guidebooks will help you do that. We'll talk about a little bit about how to do that on your own, things like that. But you really want to just dial that back. You're getting used to your gear. You're getting used to like long days where you're having to go uphill, things like this. So adding avalanche hazard on top of that really turns it into a bit of an overwhelming task for your first few times. Um, you know, I grew up in Colorado and I have to say my friends and I were just clueless back in the day, right? So you're 17, you're with your buddies and you're all psyched and you start going under ropes and things at the ski area. It's like lucky we never had a, uh, an accident or anything like that. So your first season, I would say, just stay out of avalanche terrain and then you're not gonna get buried in avalanche, right? It's rare, I've never been in an avalanche. I've not been buried in an avalanche. I haven't been tumbled off my feet in an avalanche. I've been around a couple small ones. So I don't want you to think it's any part of like regular backcountry skiing, but definitely for your first season or two, um, just don't, ha don't risk it, you know? All right, so I've been hammering that one, like correctly identifying what avalanche terrain is. We'll talk about that in just a second, how to, do, how to identify it and what it is not. And then um, the next thing maybe you start to incorporate into your day is checking that avalanche bulletin every day. So in Colorado, um, you know, Salt Lake, these places, they all have the Northwest, Jackson, Crested Butte, they all have a really active, um, fantastic avalanche uh, center. So they issue a bulletin daily starting about this time of the year. Uh, and they will give you a, a sense of, are there avalanches happening? Is there a lot of avalanche hazard out there? And start reading that on a daily basis. You can have an email to your inbox. So you get up in the morning, you go to work, whatever, and at least glance at the thing and just keep an eye on, um, you know, are people triggering avalanches? What kind of storms are happening? Things like that. And you can really start to get into the flow of um, watching how the season develops and things like that, right? So those would be two things to focus on. Avalanche terrain, and checking the bulletin every day for this first year, right? So talking about avalanche terrain. Now in North America, right? Certainly in Colorado and the lower 48, we have a ski area, right? So this is a basin. This is a great little ski hill in Colorado if you haven't been there. Um, a wonderful place. I've been skiing there since I was a little punk. And, uh, and they have a really fun uh, scene there. They have uphill um, access. They have ski, uh, like ski mountaineering races, meaning you uphill with your skins on, and then you ski down. It's, it's just a cool place. But you can see on the map here, there's a clearly defined boundary. And once you're out there skiing, if there's a fence up that says closed, you know, okay, we're not going to go in there, right? So anywhere in the, on the hill that's open has been controlled by the ski patrollers and is, you know, theoretically safe terrain. Right? So it's pretty clearly defined in North America. If you're in the ski area boundary, you're probably going to be fine. Now on a huge powder day, I'll be honest, I, I ski with a Beacon Shovel Pro with my friends, you know, certainly now that I'm skiing with my sons, right? And um, so you just, you know, it's a little bit of an easier task in North America. If you're inbounds on an open run, chances are the ski patrollers have checked it or it's just not avalanche terrain at all. So it makes it pretty easy, right? Now, as soon as we go to Europe, this is skiing in Latour. Uh, right up above um, Chamonix. If you look back there by the ski lift, right by the chairlift, you can see a bunch of people on just a little stripe of snow there that's a little more packed down than the rest. So that's what we call on piste in Europe, right? Which means off piste is right outside of that ski run. Now, here's the tricky thing in Europe anywhere off that piste is uncontrolled by ski patrol. So that could mean you're on a glacier with crevasses, that could mean you're on an avalanche slope that hasn't been bombed. 
So we're within sight of the ski hill. We skied over here without even putting skins on, but we are in uncontrolled off-piste snow at this point. So we're on our own, right? The ski patrollers haven't um, bombed anything. They're not telling us if we're safe or not. They haven't cleared this run of like rocks or stumps in the off season. So this is uncontrolled terrain. So there's different terms for this in, uh, in North America. Some people will say backcountry, slack country, side country, off piste. In Europe, we usually say off piste, but this means as soon as you slide off that piece, that marked ski run, you're on your own, right? So this is the danger of skiing in Europe a little bit. Americans come over and, uh, and are not accustomed to this, you know, oh, well, that's, you know, there was no fence. There was no uh, boundary line. I didn't see that. So those are some terms you're here. Off piste, back country, side country, slack country. To me, it's either you're in the ski area or you're in the back country. So as soon as we're out there, we're kind of on our own. Um, so just keep that in mind. As soon as you, you know, slide um, out of the ski area through the gates or whatever, you got to be making your own decisions. So um, for your first season, if you're going to do that, just make sure you're on non-avalanche terrain. And I would say probably don't be skiing on a glacier at first, even that's a, another discussion where you got to worry about crevasses and things like that too. But um, we can go backcountry skiing in loads of places where there's no avalanche hazard. There are no crevasses. And, you know, it's a relatively easy terrain to manage and see and do things like that. So some other things to think about, don't just follow the crowd that first year, because you're going to see people doing dumb stuff. And that is just the reality of it. This upcoming year is going to be really crowded in the backcountry, and uh, you're going to see people going all over the place. So take it slow, just because there's tracks leading off into the distance and it looks fun doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea. This is the top of the tram here in Chamonix. So you can see everybody walks out of the the tram and comes down this big, uh, steep, scary slope. And then as soon as you step over that little fence line, you're on a glacier skiing, right? So, you know, oftentimes there's mountain guides out here working and stuff like this and pretty competent skiers, but you just want to make sure you're not following somebody into a situation where you're not, you know, that psyched, right? So there's going to come a day too, where the skiing looks really, really good. And you're going to be really, really psyched. And just remember, you know, backcountry skiing involves a bunch more hazard um, beyond like skiing in the area. So when your stoke level gets uh, up to 10 out of 10, just take a step back and ask yourself, okay, is this a manageable situation? Do I know what I'm doing? Am I in avalanche terrain? Things like, like that. So take it slow, right? Okay. Now on a high danger day as well, if you start reading that bulletin, you're going to see a day where the danger rating goes up in terms of number or color or by name, right? There's five avalanche uh, danger ratings. And on those days where the danger is getting up there, level three, four, or five, something like that, um, the forecasters are going to be warning you about different hazards. But you can see this is a beautiful tour up in Canada, really low angle slope. There's no avalanche hazard right here. And on a high danger day, this would be a totally appropriate slope to be skiing on and uh, taking it easy on. So, you know, there's going to be those days where you just don't go out skiing. The safest option is just to go to the ski hill or not go anywhere and, uh, and don't brave uh, the highway and the, you know, blizzard conditions, right? So, now we talked about how to identify all this avalanche terrain, right? So there's a bunch of resources to do this. And once you take a good avalanche course, a level one avalanche course, we'll talk about that in a sec, you are going to have a better idea about how to do this. So there's guidebooks for all over the place. I mean, I've got a whole shelf of them up here in French and German and, and Italian and whatnot. And I spent a bunch of time trying to decipher them. Um, but all over North America, there's really helpful guidebooks. Uh, Fritz Sperry has some super ones in, in Colorado and, um, Doug Sproul's book up for Rogers Pass in Canada. I mean, these are phenomenal resources that will tell you not only where to find good skiing, but they're going to give you an um, idea about where the hazards lie, right? So guidebooks are going to be really helpful. Maps, it's really not that difficult to determine a steeper and lower angle slope on a map. It requires a little bit of coaching, but that's going to be one way you could look at a ski slope on the map and determine like, hey, is this a steeper or a shallower angle slope? Once you do a Abbey awareness course or a level one avalanche course, you're going to learn that avalanches most often happen on slopes 30 degrees and steeper. So if you can limit your skiing to slopes, let's say 25 degrees and under, and don't be on slopes connected to steeper slopes above you, that removes the avalanche hazard from your life right there. And there's a million places to ski that are low angle, safe, and wonderful, right? So that would be uh, from maps and guidebooks. And then once you're in the field, we have a bunch of different ways. Like once you get good at it, you can use your eyes and kind of look at it and say, oh, that slope's a little steeper or lower angle. Uh, but we also have everybody probably has a smartphone that's sitting there at home right now. Inside your smartphone is a clinometer, right? Uh, which just measures slope angle. You might have used it on household projects or something like that. But you can lay your ski pole down on a slope, put your um, phone on it, 
and it'll give you a rough idea of that little section of the slope. Now you don't want to ski out onto a slope and take the slope angle, but as you're skiing around on smaller slopes, you can be laying that um, pole down and putting the iPhone on there and start really calibrating your eyes for what's a 25 degree slope look like? What is a 35 degree slope like? Just a little piece of terrain, like the side of a skin track or something you can look at and say, oh, that's what a 40 degree slope would look like. And you're going to start really getting your eyes tuned to that. And then if you can identify a slope, keep it at 25 degrees, you're going to keep yourself at a avalanche terrain for, you know, I do that every day I'm out skiing and I look at slopes. And, oh, that seems steeper. Maybe I'll go left or right and just avoid that little patch. Right. So that's some ideas on ski terrain and uh, how to keep yourself in and out of avalanche terrain. You know, let's just keep out of avalanche terrain for this first season at least. And um, now let's think about you're going to go skiing. You got to go skiing with somebody, right? So you got to have a little bit of a team and put in some prep. That's my buddy, Tim skiing up there in Canada. And that's actually Tim and I standing above the slope. He was just on, we were just talking about how we were going to get a big group down there. And uh, so you got to be careful about who you're skiing with because some partners make just like everything. You go on a bike ride with your buddy who is an ex tour de France guy. He's going to crush you. Right. And so that's sometimes fun. Other times you just don't want to go out with that guy and you just want to ride slow and have a nice day. Right. And um, so you want to think about who you're skiing with and uh, we'll talk a little bit about how you might pick ski partners. Right. So, you know, we all want to go out and have fun. Like that's the bottom line. Right. So you want to be out with people that don't flake that are easy to talk to and, you know, fun to be around. You can work with them. And, uh, you know, if you can go out with your buddy, who's an EMT or a wilderness first responder or something, that's great. Then you've got a medical trained person along. If you have somebody that's really good with their beacon, awesome. If you have somebody that's involved with search and rescue, great. And, you know, if you're just going out for the first time with a buddy, well, go with somebody that is going to be willing to talk to you and be patient and make smart decisions as you're out there touring around. Right. So get, you know, get a good little group of chemistry going and go with folks you trust. Right. Okay. Some other things to think about if your buddy is trying to land his first back flip in the back country and you're just figuring out your bindings for the first day, well, you're not going to make very good touring partners for that day, right? So go out with similar goals and skills in mind. And, um, you know, that's my nephew there. That's me in the orange uh, jacket there, the RAB jacket. My nephew is right next to me on my right. So he's a young charger and he's super fit. And, um, you know, it's not going to be long here until he's leaving me for dead. But uh, he's a great guy to tour with when I want to go big. But if he and his buddies are out and they want to go ice climbing or go huge in the back country and I'm feeling like sluggish, He's not my favorite touring partner, right? Because he's young and strong and super stoked all the time, right? So pick these guys um, appropriately and risk tolerance is a huge one, right? If you are talking about going backcountry skiing and this person has a bunch of stories about avalanches and near misses and you know lost skis and injuries, uh, that might not be the best person for you. Um, and uh, just think about, does that person have fun doing the same things you do? Like, do they find it really enjoyable to limp back to the car after dark? Or do they like to be back an hour early so they have a little bit of a buffer in case somebody loses a ski or, you know, whatever the case is. So try to put together a good team and with people you can work with, right? And once you got that little posse together, you know, you want to probably sit down and have a chat. Again, a good avalanche course is going to show you how to do a lot of these things and use checklists and things like that. But think about a little med kit. Is anybody in your group asthmatic? Do you have a diabetic along? Things like that. Do you have a repair kit with you so you could fix a basic thing? Like maybe all you need is some bailing wire, a Leatherman, a couple of ski straps, things like this. But then make sure you're checking the bullets and make sure you have a really good sense of where you're going to be avoiding avalanche terrain. Is there avalanche terrain around you that you want to be careful of and things like that? Make sure it's a good group you can chat with. And I would say in terms of, you know, if this is your first season backcountry skiing, if you're an intermediate or black skier in, you know, in the resort, well, you're probably going to have a pretty good time in the backcountry. There will be days where the snow is really weird and you're going to get your butt kicked. I still do it. Everything, you know, uh, you get weird conditions and your skis are submarining and you're falling all over the place. It happens. Believe me, don't, uh, don't, don't think you're going to ski a deep powder for the rest of your life in the backcountry. So, um, you know, do the best you can, but if you're an intermediate skier in the area, yeah, you'll probably have a pretty good time uh, skiing in the backcountry, you know, and, um, in terms of basic fitness, if you can go on a three hour hike, uh, you're probably fine to go backcountry skiing. It's going to be tiring your first time uphill. You're going to have a lot of weight on your feet, but just pick a place that's mellow. Um, you know, try to follow a low angle skin track in safe terrain or put in your own skin track. That's low angle. Don't feel like you got to go straight up the hill and uh, just wander around a little bit and have some fun and, uh, and you'll get the, the hang of it pretty quick. So, 
I said this isn't an avalanche course, so here we are. I'm just going to give you some overview about where you can get some avalanche training and uh, and do some coursework if, if you're into it, right? So typically folks will go to an avalanche awareness, like a little chat at a gear shop. Maybe it's an hour long or something like that. Um, and that's a great starter, right? And we touched on a few of the things here. Avalanches happen on slopes that are generally steeper than 30 degrees. Um, you want to be reading the bullets and things like that. You guys know there's a, a hazard out there in the backcountry. So if you want to make the jump, though, the level one is typically taught over three days. So it's a 24-hour course, half that time spent in the field, right? There's a bunch of them in Colorado. There's bunches of them up in the Northwest, Utah, um, down in Tahoe, out of Bishop. Um, if you don't know where to go, give me a shout and uh, I'll help you out. Avalanche.org is a great resource that shows you all the forecast centers in the country where you can start reading the bulletin, but it'll give you some information on avalanche courses. And um, I'll give you, there's a slide later that has a bunch of these URLs. So um, that would be a first step. It'd be that level one avalanche course that's going to teach you how to identify terrain, give you an introduction on how to read the bullets and how to apply that in the field in terms of making decisions about what kind of terrain to avoid, things like that. And then uh, providers are teaching a rescue component now. It's just a one day, eight hour course. And that's really focused on the transceiver searching, shoveling, probing, and, and a rescue response. So those are, those are important skills because I will tell you eventually, um, if you do it long enough, you're going to blow it. I've blown it before. I blow it every season doing something. Fortunately, it hasn't really bit me in the butt or anything, um, but we make mistakes, right? So you got to have those rescue skills. And then there's a level two, also a 24 hour course um, that you can do. And uh, that's, that would be the next step after, let's say two, three, four seasons of touring and you're really psyched on the, on the activity. And then that would be a great, uh, a great next step. And then something we've been doing the last few years is teaching a full immersion hut based um, level two up in Canada. So these are either five or six days long. We bring a chef in there, you get helicoptered in and then it's all human power touring. And it's just five or six days of full touring. We wake up every day, do a big tour plan, talk about the danger. Then we go out and tour, we come back, debrief it, talk about what we did great, what we did wrong. And then we have a big dinner together. It's cool. And I know online this year, there's a bunch of great avalanche resources. So that's kind of an overview of avalanche education in North America. Uh, the Canadians have slightly different uh, terms, but it, they're loosely the same format. Um, in Europe, it's a little more ad hoc between different countries. If you're over here and you're interested in it, shoot me a, uh, an email and let's chat because there's definitely opportunities down here up in um, Switzerland as well. And uh, we can chat about that. So, you know, as you get into the sport, you're going to want to think about, hey, at what point can I go do this on my own? In talking to clients of mine that have, you know, progressed through the ranks, most of them after a while do a level one avalanche course. They get really familiar with the bulletin and then they get into this process where they have their own, um, you know, really sort of daily routine they get in for a day of skiing. You know, if you're buying skis this year or buying a car or something, you probably have your routine. Like maybe you read online reviews or you get uh, consumer reports or you do something like that. So we have that same process for going backcountry skiing. How do we figure out where are avalanches happening? What kind of terrain do we want to avoid? Who am I going with? You know, how do I get a weather forecast? You know, what repair safety gear, all that kind of stuff am I going to take? And, um, and that, you know, that's how we do it as professionals. And that's how, uh, you know, really savvy recreationalists do it too. So uh, I would say take that uh, rescue practice and another great option. It's a little bit spendy. I don't want to make light of it, but hiring a guy for a day, if you get four or five of your friends together, it gets to be pretty um, affordable. But if you go with a guide, she can like completely tailor the day for what you're looking for. If it's your first season and you just want to get used to your skins and bindings and all that, great, go do it. Once you've done it for a while though, and you're starting to say, hey, well, the bulletin was talking about, you know, wind slabs on this type of train. I would like to go see some of that. You know, really skilled mountain guide uh, can take you out and show you that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, get four of your friends together, go do something like that. It'd be like a relatively affordable, but really in-depth uh, focused day for you. And, um, you know, there's mentors out there and you can meet people online, but just be a little bit careful who you go with, right? Like I said, if they're telling you about near misses and avalanches they've been in, then maybe you avoid that person for the first couple of seasons and you can make your own decision about how they're doing it, right? So yeah, and keep your, uh, your psych level in check there. So um, I'll give you a little overview of my buddy Cooper. Cooper and I skied together the first time geez, I bet you six years ago, seven years ago, something like that. And Cooper started skiing as an adult. So he did not grow up in Colorado, getting to ski all over the place, whatever. And uh, Cooper has really progressed through a level one, a level two, and a bunch of training on his own, both climbing and skiing. And he has now skied all over the world. This is uh, Cooper. We were skiing together in Svalbard. 
Uh, that's a glacier down behind us that stretches for as far as you can see. Uh, we did this ski run and then actually saw a polar bear about an hour later. It was so cool. Um, but Cooper really started out as what I would call a pretty inexperienced intermediate skier. And we have now done trips to Norway and in Europe. And here's Canada skiing with Coop. And he has done a bunch of his own avalanche training and gotten really, really competent on his own. So much so that he went and did one of the first um, or one of the only ski ascent and descents of Mount Waddington in California in the last couple, three years on his own with a buddy, no guide, no nothing. So it's really been cool to see Cooper really become almost a peer to me, you know, skiing out there. And I've got some video here of Coop skiing. This is Cooper skiing up above Sunrise Lodge in British Columbia uh, two winters ago. Yeah. And this was just a stellar trip. We had, I mean, the skiing was like this every single day. We never crossed tracks. And it was so cool. So anyway, that's just a, you know, a little um, glimpse of what you can do over the course of a few seasons skiing. Cooper's really been diligent. His big passion is, uh, is skiing. And, you know, he's married, he has a great job and uh, owns his own company and all this, but he, you know, pulled it off and uh, is really a, a really competent skier on his own now. So um, be like Cooper. That's what I'm saying. So um, here's some resources for you. So this uh, webinar will be recorded and then you can watch it later or you can just, you know, crack out your phone and take a photo of this right now. Um, but these are a few books I would recommend reading, you know, of those three, that first one, Doug Littmer's guides guide to avalanche terrain is really cool. It's got a, it's an ebook. So you're going to download it onto your computer and then it's got a bunch of videos. It's got all sorts of cool stuff. It's really, really sharp. And the layout is a little clunky when you download it, but you're probably better with that stuff than me. Um, but it's just really, really well done. He's a uh, avalanche professional up in Canada. The other two books, Bruce Jameson's new book, he's doing a new um, edition of that book is coming out. He is one of the foremost uh, snow science um, academics on the planet, really high end. And that book is geared towards us though, folks who aren't doing snow physics with him in the lab. Um, that'll be a really cool resource when it comes out. Look for the, the updated edition. And then Bruce Tramper used to run the Avalanche Center in Utah. That's a great book. That's probably the most widely read Avalanche book in uh, the United States, I would say right now. Um, and I think it's on the third edition now. It's really cool. Um, so get that Avalanche training, find a course. Um, you'll hear about AAI is the American Avalanche Institute. Aerie is uh, another large provider. They do courses uh, in Colorado, all over New England, so they're a great uh, resource. They're av training, avtraining.org. Um, that's the ARI site, AAI. You can find American Avalanche Institute.com. And, um, uh, you know, look on social media. Some of the forecast centers post really cool videos and things like that, but be a little bit careful. Um, just some random Joe posting videos out there. I see some kooky stuff every so often. So uh, Facebook's fun, but heads up just be discerning with what you're consuming and then uh, my buddy will uh has a really cool blog that he worked on all this fall uh geared towards this exact audience like folks that are psyched on getting out there skiing the first time so um where the fruit uh, you can find will's uh blog he's an outdoor uh educator but an avid backcountry skier as well so he has a real conversational great style and um that'd be useful for people to read as well so uh hit me if uh, you need some help uh, getting any of that stuff um figured out and i'll and I'll help you. So, and uh, these are all things that will help you start um, developing the skills uh, you need to get out there on your own and ski in some bigger terrain. This is the Gran Paradiso National Park in Italy. You can see this is a very deep day. That's my buddy John. This was a phenomenal uh, couple of days skiing. We were actually skiing out to the road here to escape because they were going to get another meter of snow over the next two days and uh, everything was going to be shut down from avalanche hazards. So, we had a really fun run out, but we were sort of tucking tail and getting out of there before we got stuck. Um, but, you know, making uh, decisions like that will come in time. Just take it slow and get educated. And then as you get into different terrain, this is skinning in a whiteout on a glacier. Not the most enjoyable uh, morning, but you'll start to get the uh, skills necessary um, to do bigger objectives like this. And you can get some climbing training, learn your rope systems, things like that, if that interests you. Um, if it doesn't, no stress, don't do it. Or hire a guide on these days. I'll carry the rope for you and uh, we'll go out there and do it. But these are challenging days. You just wanna make sure you have the skills for it. Here's my buddy Martin skiing. This is outside of Sorcerer Lodge. This was, this was probably the second best day I've ever had skiing in Canada. It was pretty great. And uh, actually the best day I've ever had skiing in Canada was in this exact terrain this last winter and uh, pre-COVID. And um, yeah, this is Sorcerer Lodge. If you ever get a chance to go to Sorcerer Lodge, that is one of the great operations in, the, in Canada. But, you know, you got to be really careful skiing with that much snow on the ground in a big storm cycle. So, and this was in fact, right after this day, we went into a humongous uh, avalanche cycle. It was spooky. So we took it very, very easy the next couple of days like that. Yep. There's some more skiing over here in Europe with my buddy, Mikey. 
And uh, Mike's a North Face athlete and a professional mountain guy. And that's, uh, he and I were setting the track there and talking about terrain and hazards and things like that. So you just want to get your, uh, get your uh, avalanche sort of brain going here before you get into bigger terrain like that. And eventually come to Chamonix and this is the Valley Blanche, what they say is the world's most famous ski run. My friend Allie there skiing down a really just sublime day skiing in the backcountry right there. So uh, then places like that'll open up for you. And uh, just remember, it's all about having fun. It is not worth dying for. So I want you all to take it easy, stay out of avalanche terrain, relax and uh, have a great season this year.